Yes, I am from Colorado, and um, that's where I started in child nutrition. I actually, before I started my career in child nutrition, I was in the health food industry. So um, did that for about 14 years, both in the retail side and on manufacturing side. And then I decided nutrition was my passion, so I went back to school and became a registered dietitian. And then part of my internship was with the school district, and I just loved it. It was a great fit. Um, it, I never thought that I would be in this business, but I absolutely love it. And so it's my new passion that I really enjoy doing. And I'm happy to be here with you guys today. So what I'm going to be covering is specifically the grain component. Um, how many of you would say that the grain component is the most confusing component that we have? Yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? Um, so we had all these regulations that came out and they said we've got mi minimums and then maximums too. They've taken the maximums off for now. So we're gonna go through all that and what I've tried to do is collect the most recent information that I could find. The majority of this does come from the NFSMI and if hopefully most of you are familiar with that website, it's nfsmi.org and um, it's at the very last screen so you'll see that up there on the, on the last slide. And that's a really great resource. They are actually funded through the USDA specifically for our business. So they're supposed to make all the different kinds of training materials that we need, um, both for the states use some of those training materials and they're, they're materials that we can use in our kitchens as well um, with our employees to train them on anything from food safety to the components. And they just did another update in the new meal pattern training. So in it said as of September 2013. So this is the most recent information that you're going to be getting today. One of the things I did like to start with on their um, website, they also have some beautiful old photographs of this wonderful database. And this is some photographs from bread making in 1949. And you can see all the steps they had went through with proofing the rolls and everything and weighing things out. And, this, you know, these nice old mixers that some of us still have in our kitchens that are probably seven years old. <laughs> they still work. They don't make them like that anymore. Okay, um, what I'd like to cover today is we're going to talk a little bit about the calorie limits, kind of that basic regulation part. Um, we're going to work on identifying whole grains, and I'm going to have you guys do some little activities partnering up with um, whoever's next to you. And then we're going to talk about the ounce equivalents and go through some specific examples so that we're going to take some specific products and look at those and see how to identify the ounce equivalents for each of those items. Um, both, and we're also going to look at manufactured products as well as scratch recipes and what has really changed in the regulations on that. Okay, so most of the resources that you need to use for your regulations come from um, the USDA memo there's a lot, everything refers to this memo and you, should, you guys should already have it. It's one of those regular USDA memos that comes out and it's, um, the, the memo name is the SP30 2012, it's from April 2012. And so that memo actually is specific to the grains and um, it has a lot of things that we'll reference in there today. Um, you all, it also says to refer to section three of the food buying guide. So that's the, the whole grains piece of the food buying guide. And right now the food buying guide section three is under construction. So they haven't finished that yet. So I've tried to show you today um, in, through the PowerPoint of what has changed and what you need to make changes to until they actually give us a new copy of that, which they should hopefully by the end of this school year. Let's hope. <laughs> And by the way, you can't, it, the USDA's go, um, website is down, and so that is one piece that is um, of being, that we are being affected by through the government shutdown. You can't go on there and look at recipes or nutrient database or anything. Okay, so one of the things I want to start with is a calorie range. Calorie ranges are important because we do have, we have our calorie maximums. Um, even though we don't have any grain maximums, we still have to fall within those calorie ranges. And those calorie ranges are set, of course, through our K through 5, 6 through 8, 9 through 12. Um, the th other thing to keep in mind is our a la carte foods. So anything that you're selling a la carte does not count in those calorie ranges. But it does fall under those regulations of the new small maximum schools. So have, how many of you are familiar with that new regulation that just came out over the summer? Okay, and so we've got this year to comply with that. So if you're selling anything a la carte, it needs to fall with under those, within those guidelines. And that goes for the rest of your school too. So if school stores and all those kinds of things have to follow those. 
The other thing to keep in mind with the calorie ranges is that anything that you might consider an extra food, like condiments and things like that, are really important, because those do count in your calories. So anything that you have on your production record, anything that you're, um, you've got maybe after the point of sale that you're allowing students to take that's part of that meal, which would typically be condiments, anything that's a component is going to be before your point of sale. So but you've got to make sure that all those items are counted in your calories. So that's why it's on your production record. That's why it's in your nutrient analysis so that you're falling within that. And what that has to do with grains is when you're menuing your grains, make sure that you're thinking about if you're going to menu a bagel and you want cream cheese with that, that cream cheese is going to count in those calories. So make sure that you're looking at that or if there's other items that students want like syrup with pancakes or um, butter and jelly with toast and things like that. Make sure you're counting those calories because oftentimes those things can boost your calories and bump them up over the levels that you want them to be at pretty quickly. Okay, so this is a page with just the um, components amounts on there. So this is the actual grain component and it's just like the calories are. We've got K through 5, 6 through 8, and 9 through 12. Um, and we have minimums that we have to meet right now. So the maximums are gone. The minimums that we have to meet are one ounce for K through 8, basically, and eight ounces a week. So one ounce a day and eight ounce a week. So if you have just one ounce a day, are you going to meet the minimum? No. You've got to have a little bit more a few days a week in order to make that eight ounce minimum a week. And most of us aren't going to just have one ounce a minimum a day anyway, so that works out fine. Um, that now on things like for high school, you want to be careful because high school is a little bit different. You've um, grades nine through twelve is a two ounce a day minimum, which is a ten ounce a week minimum. So that's more even. Five times two is ten. But one of the things you want to make sure you're looking at, especially if you're a school that's doing that's got K through twelve. Um, and you've menued something that's a one grain, like sometimes if we have, if you have pasta or spaghetti day, and that half a cup of cu pasta is equal to one ounce equivalent, and your high schoolers come through, they need another grain with that in order to meet your minimum for that day. So you've got to make sure that you're pairing things correctly so that you're meeting your minimum for those high schoolers on those days that you might have lower amounts of grains on your menu. Okay, so part of the other minimum requirements is the, what the grains need to be. The grains have to be whole grain, whole grain rich. And so this is the last school year that we can have 50% of our grains being whole grain rich. So everybody right now should be working on looking at all of your grains, making sure that if any of your grains that are not whole grains, what are you going to be changing those to for next school year? Because this is the time to start looking at the vendors and see what they have in the manufacturers. And the manufacturers have done a pretty good job. Most of our products have changed over to whole grain. Um, but if you've got any scratch recipes that are left that are still um, using enriched white flour, you'll need to revamp those recipes and make sure that you're getting, uh, making sure that they're whole grain rich. And we'll talk about what that definition is today and how to figure that out. The other thing that you need to keep in mind when you're menuing grains is how those grains count towards those, this component and if they count as a dessert. And so we'll go through that um, in detail too. You can have up to two ounce grains equivalents be counted as a dessert item in a week. Or you can do a half an ounce grain four times in a week. Most of us aren't going to have a half, half ounce grain four times in a week, but that is possible if you want to menu that. But that's going to be part of your total amount of grains that you're counting in that week. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about why we're doing all this. And um, one of the things um, when Rich was up here talking about, you know, all the great things that we're doing and the whole rationale behind it, it's kind of good to look at the history of grains and why we're having to do whole grains and why we have to make sure that these things um, meet. And grains have, are built like this picture here. So when you, when you harvest your grain, you take off the chaff, you've got the bran and the endosperm and the germ, and that's a whole grain. Now what, over time in history, 
whole grains, because they have all these um, things, especially the germ that has those essential oils in it, those things go, go bad and spoil really quickly. And so people found over time, if they were able to take off that brand and that germ, that their grains then lasted a whole lot longer. They could keep them on the shelf longer. And what, then once the Industrial Revolution came along and we were feeding lots and lots of people and having these mass farms and things like this and having to do that, it worked out much better in order to take those grains and refine them down just to that starchy endosperm, which gives you um, calories and sometimes some protein. But it doesn't give you all the vitamins and minerals that were in there before. And what they found is that people that were have their diets were very heavy in let, let's say rice or people that were maybe in prison camps and things like that if that's all they were eating were those refined grains they came up with some pretty serious diseases and those diseases they found were connected to the lack of those nutrients and so that's how we figured out what nutrients were essential and so B vitamins and things like that we have to have those in order to live healthy lives and so what they then did instead of Going back to whole grains, they said, okay, well, we'll just enrich the grain with these particular vitamins and minerals that we know are essential to health and essential to life. So that's where we started to get into, um, probably in the 30s and 40s, where they started to enrich grain products. Then we found now, that with childhood obesity and things like that, and cardiovascular disease and um, cholesterol and all those kinds of things, that all the other stuff that was in there too, the bran and the germ, those were all really good things for other kinds of health reasons. So now we're going back to serving whole grains and wanting to get more whole grains in our diets. So those are really important things to have. And so now we as um, school lunch professionals, we're putting that back into our menus in order to make sure that the kids have the healthiest items that they can possibly get. And it was one of the ways that USDA could see that and the Institute of Medicine could see that this is a great way for us to be able to get those nutrients back to our kids that need them the most. <coughs> so one of the things to keep in mind is keep this little picture in mind of this piece of grain because it's, everything is still a whole grain even if they chop it up and um, refine it down to flour, it's still gonna be a whole grain as long as everything is still intact when they're making it and refining it. So it might be cracked wheat where they open it up, um, all those kinds of things. Oh, and you know what, did Roxanne bring back the Handouts. Okay. You know, Terry, I forgot to hand out the. Let me see if she brought these back. She did. Yay. Okay. So these are. Make sure this. 15, 15. Okay. So we've got this one. I'm not sure if the. Which one are you looking for? I'm just. I know that there were some that weren't. These all the new ones. Did she take the old ones away? I think so. Okay, so both of these, and then this one too. Sorry about that. I didn't realize you guys didn't have the PowerPoint. So we're gonna have you're gonna have two things here. You're gonna have a, the PowerPoint presentation, and you're also gonna have um, a participants workbook. Is the second one. And while they're passing that out, I'll talk a little bit about whole grains in general. So the different kinds of whole grains that you're going to find um, are going to be things that will actually say whole in front of them. So these are all the different kinds of whole grains that you're going to find on labels. And so you guys need to become really good at la label readers if you're not already. Um, look at all of your ingredients on everything that you're buying and making sure that they're all going to meet because starting July 1st, this summer, this upcoming summer, we have to make sure that we're meeting these requirements and all of our products have to be whole grain rich. And so you need to become very familiar with what whole grains are and how to identify those. So you'll see sometimes the word whole is there, like with whole wheat and um, th those kinds of things. So maybe sometimes you'll see whole corn. But then there's other things that don't necessarily have the word whole in front of them. They're still whole grains, like amaranth and quinoa. Those are two newer grains that you see in the marketplace more. Um, anybody tried those or familiar with both of those? They're a little different, but they're really good. Different kinds of grains, kind of expensive though for school lunch, but sometimes you can add those in occasionally. Um, cracked wheat, so that's where they've taken that wheat berry and they've just cracked it open. 
And so what we're doing with things like cracking wheat or um, steel cut oats and things like that, we're making it easier to digest and easier to cook. So it's really actually important to crack open most of those things because like whole wheat berries, they're pretty much going to, unless you chew them really well, they're going to stay berries. <laughs> so um, whole wheat flour, gram flour, the entire wheat flour, you might see the words bromated whole wheat flour, millet flakes, and whole wheat, whole durum wheat flour. And that's another one I want to point out is on your pastas, that's, that can be a tricky spot um, because it might say semolina or durum wheat. And that might sound like a whole grain, but it's not unless they actually say that it's a whole durum wheat or a whole semolina. Things that won't have that word whole in front of them are things like brown rice, wild rice, bulgur, and then soba noodles is on here too, and that's typically made from whole buckwheat, but you need to check and make sure that that is whole buckwheat. And then the next page you'll see is a list of things that are not whole grain. So these are things that you might still see in ingredients because when we talk about things that are whole grain rich, it means that the product is at least 50% whole grain. So the other 50% could be things that are not whole grain. So these are the different kinds of grains that, could be, that are not gonna be whole grain, but they've still gotta be enriched. Again, we go back to the history of the grains. The reason it has to be enriched is we've gotta make sure that those vitamins and minerals are put back in there so that we're making sure that we're controlling those nutrients diseases. So things like the trickier ones are the wheat flour. When it says wheat flour, oftentimes we think that's whole wheat and that's sometimes an easy one to pass by, but it's not. It's white flour. It's just another name for white flour. Um, hominy grits, farina, things like that. Those might seem like a whole grain, but they're not. So everything on this list is going to be something that is not a whole grain and we need to make sure that those products are enriched or they're paired with that whole grain within the product. Okay, and the next page is your little first activity. So I'd like you to work with the person next to you and fill this out and you're gonna either say yes it's a whole grain or mark no and I'll give you guys a few minutes to do that together and then we'll go over the answers. Okay, is everybody pretty close to done? <laughs> Okay, we've got some people that are all done. So let's go through this together. The first one is amaranth. Is that a whole grain? Yes. Yes. Bulgur? Yes. Yes. Because bulgur is cracked wheat. Again, it's just that wheat that's been cracked open so that we can get the nutrients out of it. Um, buckwheat groats? Yes. Yes. Because again, that's that groat, um, which oftentimes means it's just cut. Brown rice? Yes. Yes. That's an easy one. Couscous. No, correct. Couscous is actually um, considered kind of a pasta. It's, it's very refined and um, little teeny tiny uh, little beads basically. Um, and it cooks really, really quickly. So that's another hint too. If it cooks really quickly, it's probably a refined grain. Now you can get whole wheat couscous. There is such a thing. It takes a little bit longer to cook, but basically couscous, you just boil the water, you put it in, you put the lid on, wait for five minutes and it's done. So it's a really quick grain. Um, Degerminated cornmeal, no, right? So again, there's that germ, that part of that, and it's degerminated, so they've taken that off. They've taken away those nu nutrients in that cornmeal. Graham flour, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. um, grits, no. And that's kind of a tricky one too, because grits look kind of like a whole grain. They look like they're still just ground up corn, but they're not, so they've been refined in some way. Instant oatmeal. Yes. Okay, that's good. Long grain white rice. No. Okay. And uh, millet flakes. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Pearled barley. No. no. Right. Quinoa. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Rolled oats. Yes. yes. Semolina. No. no. So semolina you'll find in things like pasta. It's typically where you're going to find semolina, and it's it's basically a kind of a wheat. Um, grain. Wheat flour? No. Rye berries? Yes. Correct. Whole grain barley? Yes. yes. Whole wheat flour? Yes. yes. And whole or white whole wheat flour? Yes. yes. So this is a newer product to the marketplace is the white whole wheat flour. It's actually um, a, they 
the regular wheat that you whole wheat that you see out there is called red or winter wheat, and, and so it has the the color of the bran is actually kind of a reddish brownish tint to it. But what they've done is they've you know with uh, breeding and things like that, they've found some um, strains of wheat that don't have that color in the brand, so you still get the benefits of the fiber and all those kinds of things. It's just that red color is not there anymore, so it looks white. And it's a little lighter, and so it works better in some things like breads and um, muffins and things like that. So we're seeing that in a lot in manufactured items too because it's more palatable um, for the kids and, and things like that, but it's still going to give them all the nutrients that are found in your whole grains. Okay. Any questions on what a whole wheat or whole grain is? Yes. Okay, so the question is about gluten-free. That's a good question to bring up. So there are, basically gluten is going to um, be in your barley, um, oats, wheat, and rye. So that's the, the little acronym is BRAU. Um, barley, rye, oats, and wheat. And so and the, the gluten is a protein in the flour, um, in the actual grain itself that people have some intolerances to and their intolerances can be just a little bit where they can have maybe some kinds of uh, gluten products and then you've got people that are full-blown celiac that can't have any gluten whatsoever. So anything that's not in that brow family um, are okay for people that need to be on a gluten-free diet or that are celiac. But the thing to keep in mind is that it's not always that simple because there's a lot of things that are kind of a cousin, like semolina wheat is, a, is an actual wheat, so it's going to have gluten in it. So you'd need to make sure that you're finding products that are specifically saying that they're gluten-free um, or using corn and rice. So corn and rice are th typically things that we're already using in our menus, and so those are things that are going to be safe for someone that needs to stay away from gluten. Mm -hmm. aren't whole grain? Correct. So, so, and that's, I haven't seen anything. I did try and find anything on that. There's, I can't find anything that says that if you have to make a special diet, it has to necessarily follow that whole grain. But things like amaranth and quinoa, um, those are all gluten-free grains that you can use, and those are whole grains too. So if you can combine those in um, your menu some, that would be good too. But I think that we have that, we do have that availability or that flexibility to make changes for those students that are on an IEP program or that need special diets and it doesn't have to be exact to what the regulations are. We can make those exceptions when we need to and it's still a reimbursable meal. So any other questions on whole grains? Yeah. Hominy? It, it means that they must have taken something out of there, whether it's the bran or the germ of the um, of the whole grain itself. So I'm not sure exactly which piece they take out, but it must be a part of that. Any other questions on whole grains? Okay, let's move forward. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about the ounce equivalents. So in your packet, on the very last two pages, we're going to look at exhibit A, which is that chart that you might be familiar with. So this is in that memo as well that I was talking about at the beginning of the um, session. This is what they refer to in that chart all the time. So this is the newest updated version. You, there's also a version of this in your food buying guide, but that's old and outdated, so you don't want to use that one anymore. This is the one that you want to go by. And one of the things that I want to teach you about this chart, it, it helps me understand kind of the flow, there is an actual pattern to this chart and why things are grouped the way they did. So what the USDA tried to do with this is they tried to make it, they tried to take what are, what are our basic products um, and they're going to group them all together and they're going to say, well this group of products is approximately this many grain ounce equivalents. So that's, that's what this chart is used for. So this is going to help you figure out when you've got a product and how you're going to count it as an ounce equivalent. And if you start with the first section, so you've got two columns. Column A is, has your group, so you've got group A, group B, group C. And then the column on the right is going to be your ounce equivalents for those items. So let's start with the first section. That first section where it says group A 
is the bread type coating, breadsticks, the hard breadsticks, chow mein noodles, savory crackers, pretzels that are hard, and stuffing. When you think about all these products, if you think about the texture of them, they're really dense. They're very, very dense with the flour that's in there. And if you look at the ounce equivalents, that we're, we're going to look at the example for a one ounce equivalent on each of these. That one ounce equivalent is 22 grams or 0.8 ounces. So that's a little bit less than an ounce. And so if we're looking at a scale and we've got 0.8 ounce of the, uh, let's say, breadsticks, hard breadsticks, we only need less than an ounce to equal that ounce equivalent. So there aren't very many, not very many of our menu items are like that. Um, so what you would do is you would look at the package, see what the ounce, the number of ounces or grams are on that package, find it on here. So let's say I had a breadstick package that said it was a 0.8 ounce breadstick. I would see that 0.8 ounces gives me a one ounce equivalent. And that's how I would measure that and credit that on my components. And then the next group, this is where the majority of our products are going to be. So this is your bagels, breads, biscuits, um, sweet crackers, English muffins, pizza crusts, rolls, tortillas, taco shells. All of these are an ounce for ounce equivalent. So that's pretty easy. An ounce of tortilla chips is an ounce equivalent of grains. A one ounce slice of bread is a one ounce equivalent of grains. So that's the, that's the easiest section to look at. So anytime you're looking at any of those items, it's just an ounce for ounce. So if it's a half an ounce slice of bread, it's a half an, it's a, a half an ounce equivalent, okay? The next group, so as we go on here, now the scale is gonna start to tip the other way. So now we're at the even part of the scale. Now we're gonna go the other way. And these products in group C are cookies. And these are plain cookies, so nothing that's frosted or iced. Cornbread, corn muffins, croissants, pancakes, pie crusts, and waffles. So when you think about these products, what other items are in these products besides flour that's different from the products in group B? Sugar. What else? Eggs. Eggs. Sometimes fats and oils, right? So now we're, that, that same ounce of product is not going to have as much flour in it because it's got other things taking up that space like eggs, sugar, oil, and things like that. So now you've got to have more of that product to equal that ounce equivalent. And so now the scale starts to drop down. So as you'll see on the first example there, it takes 1.2 ounces of, <coughs> let's say, a pancake to equal a one ounce equivalent. So the scale's starting to go down. Now if you look at the next section, group D, donuts, cereal bars, breakfast bars, granola bars, muffins. I want to really point out muffins because we do a lot of muffins in our business. Sweet rolls, so that's going to be your cinnamon rolls that are not frosted. Toaster pastries, the scale's going down even more. Now you've got to have two ounces of the product to equal a one ounce grain equivalent. So you've got to have double the amount because there's so much more sugar and fat and things like that in the product that are taking up the place, the space of that. Okay, you're seeing the pattern? Okay. Next group, group E, cereal bars, breakfast bars, granola bars that have nuts, dried fruit, and chocolate pieces in them. Cookies that have nuts, raisins, and chocolate pieces in them. Donuts, French toast, sweet rolls, and toaster pastries that are all frosted. The other thing I want you to see in both of these groups is see the little number four every once in a while? Okay, somebody find the number four at the bottom and tell me what that says. Allowed for desserts at lunch as specified. So anything that's got that little number four for it, you can use it as a breakfast item. Or if you're serving it at lunch, you have to count this as a dessert. And so that has to now count as that two ounce per week that you, that you have, that you can only use for desserts for that whole week, okay? So pay attention to that little number four. That's an important one to remember. Now this group, you've got to have 2.4 ounces to equal that one ounce. So the scale's going down even more. Okay, group F is cake that's unfrosted and coffee cake, 2.9. So that's almost triple the amount to get one ounce. And then group G is brownies that are plain and cake, all varieties that are frosted. 
And that's almost quadruple, a little more than quadruple, 4.4 ounces to get one ounce equivalent. Okay, so does that kind of help you see the pattern in this, pro this exhibit? Okay, so we stop there with the pattern. The pattern stops at that point. In group H is where we have all those other products. So these are things that you're gonna make, like um, you're gonna put, cook off your rice, your whole grain rice, um, your pastas, and your breakfast cereals. These are all an ounce for ounce equivalent. So we're back to the easy ones. Phew, we don't have to worry about that. It's just ounce for ounce. Um, also, you can count it as, once it's cooked, then you can count it as a half a cup. So a half a cup is gonna equal your ounce equivalent or your dry one ounce. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. The last group is group I. That's your ready to eat breakfast cereals that are cold and dry. Um, so those are gonna be 1.25 cups for a puff cereal or one ounce. So that's, you've gotta have, since it's a puff, if it's puff cereals, it's of course, you know, taking up more space, there's more air in there. So you've got to have a little bit more, but your cereals are, your dry cereals are an ounce for ounce equivalent. okay? Granola is the one exception there. So you only have to have a quarter cup of granola to equal an ounce equivalent. And when you think about it, most of the time granola is made of oats that are not cooked and they're not puffed or anything like that. So it's a much more dense grain in there. That's how I think about it. Okay, any questions on this chart? Okay, so we're gonna work together and go through a few things. I wasn't sure how big our group would be, so we'll just kind of all go through this together. I might ask for, can I get some volunteers to help me? Anybody wanna volunteer? Any volunteer? I, all I want you to do is find something on here and read it for me. You don't have to figure it out. Everybody's gonna help you figure it out. Okay, so what do you have there? So she has Triscuit crackers. Where, where is she going to find? She wants to serve these with tomato soup one day. Okay. And she needs to figure out. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. So what group is she going to look in? A. Group A. Right. Under the savory crackers. Okay. So if she needs to make a grain, a whole or a, a one ounce equivalent, how many grams of crackers does she need? 22. And what do you find serving on your? Serving size is 28. There's six of them. So six, six of them. 28 grams. Six of them are 28 grams. Six crackers is 28. Whenever you're figuring out your components, they want you to round down to the nearest quarter ounce grain. So if you're a little bit over, it's not enough to go be, to, to be another ounce or a quarter ounce, then you're going to round down. So you'd want about six crackers to make your one ounce equivalent of the Triscuits. Thank you. Okay, I need another volunteer. Good job. Okay, who's next? Who's gonna do bread? Come on up. <laughs> okay, so this is Rudy's Organic Whole Wheat Bread. It's gonna be perfect for your menu, right? Okay, so which section, which group is she going to look in? What's the product again? It's bread. Sliced bread for sandwiches. So group B she's going to look under because that's where breads, on the fourth bullet down, bread, sliced whole wheat, French, Italian, pretty much any bread product. And so how many ounce, what, what ounce equivalency is it? One to one. One to one. Easy. So what's a slice? A slice is 1.5 ounces. Ooh, 1.5 ounces. That's a pretty big slice. So if I'm going to make a sandwich with two slices of bread, can I, what, can I do that? That's three grains, three ounce equivalents. Can I do that at elementary school? Probably shouldn't. I could, but that's a lot. That's going to really increase my calories. How many calories is one slice? 100. So 200, 200 calories just for the bread, plus the meat. Maybe I put some cheese on there. I'm going to be way over my calories. And so, but maybe in high school, could I maybe do this? Maybe, maybe occasionally do a bigger bread. Or maybe I look, need to look for a smaller bread that's not quite so much per slice. Thank you very much. Good job. Okay, next one. Graham crackers, ABC graham crackers. Who wants to help me? 
Thank you, Linda. Okay, so what section should Linda look in? <coughs> B, right. We're in the same, same section. These are graham crackers. So it says sweet crackers, graham crackers, all shapes, and animal crackers. So is that a whole grain, Linda? 51% whole grain. Right, so, so we're good. It. And it is and how much one, does ounce it? one ounce. One ounce. So can one she use one. this? One to one. one to one. Very good. That was an easy one. Okay, last one. Who likes a challenge? <laughs> it's a granola bar. Okay. All right. So she's got a granola bar. What section is she going to use? So we're going to go with. We're going to go with D because there's no raisins or um, chocolate chips or anything in there. It's just a straight granola bar with oats and honey and it's going to be perfect, right? So how many ounces does she need to have if she wants to try and get well, a whole grain out of that? Two. Two. So how many ounces or um, grams is on there? 27 grams. Okay, so it's 27 grams. Does 27 grams, what, what's going to give her a half an ounce on here? 28. She's out. one gram off and you round down. So that whole granola bar is only going to be a quarter grain because you have to round down to the nearest quarter of an ounce. Okay, so that's not going to really help me on my menu. I might sell this a la carte instead. And what's the other little the other little thing I need to know about this product and how I need to count it as a dessert, right? Because it's got the little number four by it. So now this has got to count in that two ounce per week that I have for desserts. So you can give that every day and you would never meet there the you dessert. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> And okay. the kids be happy because they're getting dessert oh, yeah. every day. <laughs> okay, so do you all feel pretty good about being able to figure out your ounce equivalents? Okay, excellent. Okay, the next part, so you're going to continue going through your packet here. And we're going to look at page 16 on your packet. At the top it says evaluating whole grain rich food products handouts. So this is the step, these are the two different elements that we're required to look at when we're looking at a product. The first element is making sure that we meet the ounce equivalent requirements for the grain product as defined. So we're going to make sure that it's got the, that it's whole grain rich and that any other flours in there are going to be enriched, right? And that it meets something on that exhibit A. The second thing that we need to make sure that we do is in element two, it says we've got to meet at least one of the following three things. So when we're evaluating our products, to know that it's whole grain rich, that's what these three things are about. So A, in order to know that that product is whole grain rich, the whole grain content per ounce equivalent based on your little attachment that we just went through must be at least eight grams or more for groups A through G. For groups H and I, the volumes or weights listed must be offered to credit as one ounce equivalent. This information may be determined from information provided by the manufacturer. I would highly suggest you get the information from the manufacturer because most labels don't have enough information for you to make that call of whether or not it is going to meet, okay? And they should really do that work for you. You know, you shouldn't have to put in all that time and effort to try and figure it out. They've, you're, you're the customer. Call them and tell them, if you want me to carry your product, you need to provide this information for me. The second option you have is if the product actually has that Food and Drug Administration approved um, labeling on it, which says diets are rich in whole grain foods and other plant foods, low in fat and saturated fat, and cholesterol may reduce the risk of disease and some cancers. Now there's, this one is a little bit more confusing because sometimes they might have some other claims on there or they might be making their own claims. So, but this is a very specific one that the FDA, it's got to have this exact wording on it. It can't be anything else. You know that it's a 51% or more whole grain product. 
And the last one, which is the easiest one, is if your first ingredient on your product is a whole grain. So if, you, if the first ingredient, because all ingredients on product labels have to be in, based in weight, and so you know for sure that it's whole grain rich if it's the first one. Now there are some tricky ones out there. If let's say you found a whole grain bread that you really liked and the first ingredient said wheat flour, or, yeah, wheat flour which is not whole wheat flour. The second ingredient said um, whole wheat flour and the third ingredient said oat flour. You don't know what the percentages are of that. If that first one, that first one could be 40% white flour, and the second one's 30% whole wheat flour, and the third one's 30% whole oat flour, you've got a 60% whole grain product, but it's not, it's an order of weight. So again, you need to get the manufacturer involved and get them to get you those percentages so you know what you're serving and that it is a whole grain product. Okay, so we're gonna do some more activities here. So with your partner next to you, whoever's next to you, I want you to do rock, paper, scissors, okay? Ready? Rock, paper, scissors, go. Okay, everybody that won with rock, I want you to do the first, the first one, the whole wheat bread. Everyone that won with paper, do seven grain bread. And everyone that won with scissors, do the pizza with the whole grain crust. So you're gonna look at these next few items. You've got everything that you have in front of you to decide on this product. There's a chart on page 17 that you're gonna fill out on that product. You're gonna say, is it the product serving size? First ingredient, or is it a whole grain? Go through all those things and fill that out and we'll go through the answers together, okay? How are we doing on time? We're okay. This was supposed to be here at 10.45 and that's when people were supposed to go to the food show because it starts at 11. Oh, yikes. 10.50, yeah, but Should we? No bus out there. Oh, no. <laughs> who, so, who got the bus? I thought it was a school bus. I didn't, nobody oh, told me so to get a bus know, ready. Now I know nothing about the bus, I'm sorry. I'm gonna go, I think we could probably all find a way. Yes, it's not we could all um, carpool, I'm sure. I thought that's what it said. Yeah, it, it, it did on the, oh, okay. on the, um, on the agenda. It had Maybe everyone. <laughs> yeah, that, I think that's worth um, a call. How much more time do you need? Um, the, they probably need a good five minutes. I'll go through it with them over the next maybe five minutes and then I'll just do the scratch recipes real quick because it's okay, pretty straightforward. 10, yeah, 10-15 minutes. minutes probably. Okay. I live in Fort Collins. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty nice and it's pretty easy to meet. No, we didn't. They got all we got all the snow up here and hardly anything. Lots of rain down there though, but that same night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The dirt around Fort Collins is kind of black, slippery stuff. Uh huh. It just destroys shoes. Yes. We have lots of yeah, the outside shoes lined up. <laughs> You know, I think I know that you can still 
take boats up there because I see people up on the reservoir all the time with boats. So yeah, it's it's beautiful up there. I love going up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I enjoy it. Okay, we're we're kind of running short on time, so I'm going to go over the answers now. So if I can get your attention again, please. <clears throat> okay, so the whole wheat bread, the first one. Um, the product serving size was 28 grams. The primary first ingredient was whole wheat flour. And the whole grain ingredient was whole wheat flour. Is this product a whole grain? Yes. Is this product creditable? Yes. And does the product require a manufacturer documentation? What do you think? No. But you, need, you always need to keep your labels. Put them in your spec books. Make sure that you have everything there so that when Terry comes to audit you, it's all ready to go. Okay, the second product is a seven grain bread product. The serving size was 41 grams. The primary first ingredient was enriched wheat flour. What's, is that a whole grain? No. no, right. The whole grain ingredients are whole wheat flour cracked with whole barley, whole rye flour, whole grain rhinocol, I don't even know what that one is. Whole grain um, millet. I think they got that wrong. So that we've got several whole grain ingredients in there. So, hmm, interesting. And then, is this a whole grain product? Possibly. Possibly, yeah. Possibly. Although the product states only 8.5 grams of whole grain per 41 grams of product, it does not meet the 8 grams per the 28 gram criteria. So. Um, based on Exhibit A and Group B, that's where they got that information from, <coughs> okay? So it might be, we still would need to get, so is the product creditable? Maybe. Um, if we can get a spec from the manufacturer, so the last column, I would say yes. You definitely need, need to get a spec from the manufacturer on this product to find out if it's creditable, and then you'll know for sure whether or not you can credit it towards your menu. Okay, the third product is the pizza with the whole grain crust. Um, do we know what the serving size is of just the crust? It wasn't on there, okay? So we don't know the weight of just the crust. The primary first ingredient for the crust was white whole wheat flour. So the whole grain in it is white whole wheat flour. Is this product a whole grain? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. um, can we cre use this product to credit towards our menu? possibly we have on here. The reason um, we say possibly is because we don't really have the CN information, so we don't know for sure how much of everything is in there. So we don't know exactly how to credit it and how many um, grains and things like that. So we'd need that documentation of the serving size of the actual crust. We'd need the documentation of the weight of the whole grain. So that's, that's what we would want to look for on our documentation. But most manufacturers are going to do that for you anyway. So you don't really have to worry about that too much. Okay. So we're getting close to time to go to the show. I've got one more item to go over with you, which we can do pretty quickly. The scratch recipes. So the one thing in the scratch recipes that I need you to remember is that how many of you are still doing scratch? Most Almost everybody is, that's good. Um, so whenever you're doing scratch recipes, the main thing you need to know is you still use the same chart that you used before. So this is in the food buying guide. There's a worksheet in there. And you just fill out the worksheet just as it says. The thing that you're gonna change now is that in, instead of the 14.7 grams that you used before, you're gonna use 16 grams to, make, to do your calculations. So for example, Let's say you had a recipe that had 800 grams of whole wheat flour and 800 grams of enriched wheat flour. So we've got our 50% there. And both of those grains are creditable because they both, one's whole wheat and the other one is enriched. So a total in that recipe is 1600 grams of creditable flour. I've got, this is a 50 serving recipe. So I'm gonna take that 1600 grams divided by 50 servings and that gives me 32 creditable grams per serving. Then I'm gonna take that and divide that by 16. That's that number that changed. So it's instead of 14.75, you're gonna use 16 instead. And that's gonna give me a two ounce equivalent per serving. So this could be a roll, um, a nice big dinner roll, would be a two ounce equivalent. 
And so when you, wait, when you do that worksheet for a recipe, print out your recipe, print out your worksheet, put them together and put them in your specs books. And then you don't have to worry about it again. And then Terry's happy when she comes, you've got everything together for her. Okay, um, I can take any questions on grains. Does everybody feel like they understand it a little better now? Good, great. Um, Terry, did you have anything to say? Thank you guys.